Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation. We'll begin with our land acknowledgement. We would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather and which the Peel District School Board and the Woodlands School operates is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. For thousands of years, Indigenous peoples inhabited and cared for this land and continue to do so today. In particular, we acknowledge the territory of the Anishinaabek, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples, the land that is home to the Métis, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land and by doing so, give our respect to its first inhabitants. As we review important information tonight, uh, we welcome you to ask questions. Please go ahead and type your questions in the chat and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. We will also record this presentation um, for you to view later if needed. Um, and now for some introductions. Um, this is our team. <laughs> we see here, I would first like to take a moment and introduce um, Ms. Downey, who is our newest member. Um, as you may know, Ms. Vigliota is on maternity leave, so we are so happy to have with us until the end of semester one, Ms. Downey. Ms. Downey has a lot of experience working as a counselor at many schools. We're so happy to have her join our team, and uh, you may have already connected with her talking about some community service hours or met her uh, in the hallway on Tuesdays or Thursdays doing guidance on the go and answering your course selection questions or helping with post-secondary applications. So welcome, Ms. Downey. Thank you. Sorry, I'm we're still meeting. Uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. And although I probably don't know many of you yet, I'm hoping as time goes on for the rest of the semester that I'm here, you will get to know me and I'm excited to be able to answer your questions. Uh, I have been in guidance for quite a number of years since the mid 90s. And so that if you're wanting help with your post-secondary planning, um, you know, career advice, I, I'd be happy to help you with that. Thank you, Ms. Downey. Um, and my name is Effie Lagudis, and uh, I'm going to be the guidance counselor for students with last names A to L. Uh, that is a bit of a change. As we mentioned, Ms. Vigliota is on her mat leave. Um, so I will be helping students with last names A to L. And I do know a lot of you already. And for those of you uh, who may not know me, I can also help you with post-secondary planning. I can help with scholarships. I'm the person in charge of the dual credit program. Um, and I'll be telling you a little bit more about that this evening. And now I would like to introduce Ms. Orr, our head of our department and guidance counselor, who is going to be working with students with last names M to Z. Um, Ms. Orr has uh, quite a few things here that she, she's, she's in charge of, and she's also going to be helping you all with your planning for post-secondary um, and for helping you with different opportunities around the school at Duke of Edinburgh and a lot of other things that she's probably going to be better at telling you about. So I will pass it on to her. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, so as Ms. Laguda said, if you have questions about post-secondary, we all uh, help with the workshops that are running until the holiday break. Uh, as well as through to January when those applications are due. You can also come and see me if you are stumped for community service hours, if you need help with your course selection, if you're interested in the Duke of Ed Award, which is great for service skill. Some of the stuff you're already doing anyway, so why not get an additional award for it? There's three different levels. Uh, and if you want to learn more, just, uh, you know, you can make an appointment with me and I'm happy to discuss it. Uh, we also do uh, the peer tutoring. Uh, is, uh, if you want to be paired up as a peer tutor or with a peer tutor, I can help you with that as well. Um, yeah, so that's a bit about me. And again, if you've got the last names M through Z, uh, you can go to the student services site and I can make an uh, appointment with you uh, through there. And so now we are going to get started uh with what you can actually do on the student services site uh, so many of you may have seen the link it's on a lot of our signatures it's on the posters throughout the school uh, and if you've not yet been onto the website 
Things that you can do are make an appointment with your guidance counselor, seeking academic support, any announcements that are community events or workshops. So that's even some of the uh, resources that we get from local universities that are running programs through March break. There's a great Reach Ahead kinesiology program that is through U of T. That's up there on the site. Uh, if you're looking for community service opportunities and as well as submitting your hours, you can do all of that through the student services site course selection information and resources. So the rec recording of this presentation as well as the presentation itself is going to be on the student services site under course selection information. So you can uh, access everything through there as well as my blueprint resources if you get stumped. Important links are on there. Uh, things about our library, learning commons, uh, maps, calendars, mental health resources, post-secondary planning. So if you finish this, uh, watching this and you kind of really want to see what's in store for you next year in terms of post-secondary planning. We did a presentation about a month or so ago and the recording and presentation is up there. So you can even really start getting ahead of your research and checking that out as well as uh, specialist high skills major. So if you're already in SHSM and you've got some questions about it, there's information there as well as special education and enhanced learning. So tons of information on there. We are adding information nearly every day and um, it's a great resource for both students and parents. So now we are going to look at what it is that you actually need to graduate, which is super important, obviously. So you need to complete your 40 hours of community service. You're going to have to do your literacy test. So you're going to have a chance to do that this year uh, as well as, oh, I need to update that. It's 30 credits by the end of June of 2024. <laughs> so I'll update that little slide before I post it. So what we're going to talk about first and foremost is your community service criteria. And this is where a lot of students get uh, into some trouble when they are ready to graduate and they're looking at their community service and they're submitting all of their hours at once and then unfortunately the guidance counselor has to sit there and say that while this is great volunteering it's not community service and so we've got a whole list of resources up on the student services site so that you can actually uh, go there, see what is an eligible and ineligible activity for volunteering versus community service. So what you really want to stick to is uh, any kind of organization or foundation that is not for profit that relies on volunteers to, to subsidize pricing. And so what that means is, let's say you want to volunteer at the YMCA. It's a great place to do it because they rely on volunteers in order to do um, cheaper pricing for classes like swim lessons or um, coaching of some variety. They rely on volunteers to be able to do that lower cost pricing. Uh, private instructors like private ski hills, private tennis clubs, these are not subsidized pricing and so uh, that's not going to qualify. Also for a lot of students who are like, yes, I participate in a nonprofit organization. I am the VP of fundraising. While that is great leadership and volunteering experience, that is also not community service. Even if it is a not-for-profit, even if it is, you know, a total charity organization, if you are holding an executive position, you don't get those hours. Now, if you help with an event on the day of, you can have those hours. If it's a community event and it qualifies, you can get those hours, but not for the work that you're doing as an executive member because it's a titled position. It's something that you took on. Um, so you wanna be really careful about that. And so when in doubt, ask your guidance counselor. And we're gonna say that a lot, especially when it comes to community service. When in doubt, ask your guidance counselor. There are some great opportunities and resources out there for you to do that is a uh, community service. So we've done examples. So you volunteering at Community Food Bank, being a camp leader at a not-for-profit, a camp that offers subsidized pricing. So that's a lot of the city camps, right? So City of Mississauga has camps during uh, March break as well as throughout the summer, and they rely on volunteers to be able to subsidize some of their costs. So that counts. Uh, assisting schools with events and charities, joining the peer mentoring tutoring program through student services counts, assisting or visiting animal shelters. Be very careful though, some vet clinics won't qualify as community service. They'll count as volunteering, but not community service, where animal shelters often do rely on volunteers to be able to um, 
carry forward. Uh, and then the same thing, retirement home, long-term care facilities, hospitals and the like. But what you want to avoid is so, like tutoring is great at the school level, not so much when you're doing it for something like Spirit Math or Oxford, Sylvan, Kumon, all that kind of stuff. It's not going to count uh, because that is a private organization that is making money based on your volunteer work. And then there's sometimes things that you do that you just really should be getting paid for. OK, so don't. Uh, you don't want to get caught up into something that you either a it's just volunteering which is great and it's great experience but it doesn't qualify as community service or something that you should be getting paid for or someone else should be getting paid for so those are the things that you really want to be uh, careful about so with that said we're going to now get into my blueprint so by now everyone should definitely know how to access my blueprint but if you are new to the board uh, you will have access to, to that through your byod so you're going to log into BYOD and then you can search for my blueprint or you can go right down to the bottom where it says view all apps, scroll down and then you're going to find my blueprint. Uh, from there, you're going to check a couple of things. We're going to post a video uh, within the next day or so about how to check various things within my blueprint to make sure that you are on track. And the two most important things are going to be the graduation progress. Uh, as well as making sure that you are selecting those correct courses. OK, so the first thing is your uh, academic trackers that you see through the high school. So you'll see what it is uh, that you took in grade nine, grade 10, grade 11, um, and even some of your grades that are in there. And you can track your progress for that. And then that's also where you're going to be selecting your courses. You can start selecting your courses now. Uh, you can't submit until January 10th, but you absolutely can start selecting these courses right now so that you can get yourself organized and submit as soon as January 10th rolls around. The second thing I really want you to check is that graduation progress, and you're going to see a slew of green check marks. Green is good. If you are missing a green check mark after you have um, selected your courses or even before you select your courses, you're really going to want to make sure that you're going back and you're reviewing what that criteria is. So it could be that you're missing an English or you're missing a French or you're missing a phys ed, whatever it is, you're going to want to make sure that you've got it done. And if you scroll all to the way to the bottom of that page, you're also going to see your community service hours. You're going to see your literacy test and all of that information in there. So super important that you have all of that checked off because by the end of grade 11 you should have your three english three math two science at least um, geography history physical education french or esl uh, so not everyone took french and that's fine but then that means if your green check mark isn't ticked off for french please contact your guidance counselor so that we can go into the student information system and we can make that substitution for you and then plus whatever elective courses you've taken uh, along the way. So we have course offerings available for uh, um, you to review within my blueprint, as well as we are going to be hosting a virtual course fair that's a website uh, that's going to go live December 1st. And what that's going to do is it's got videos from uh, students that are going to talk about what it is that they do in their classes. It's got pictures, it's got examples of lessons uh, and all of that. So really going to be a useful resource for you. And it's not on the Student Services V2L, it's on the Student Services site, which I've already uh, given you the link to. Uh, so you're going to want to double check that you are accessing that come December 1st. You're also going to want to make sure that in my blueprint, if you have any questions about, you know, maybe I really want to do design technology. Well, what is it? Well, you can look that course code up and then you can actually see what that's all about. Or if you want to see personally from experience what students have been doing in that class, you can go to the virtual course fair and actually hear it from students themselves. And then as always, if you have any questions, you can reach out to Ms. Lagudis, myself or Ms. Downey uh, to ask questions about specific courses or pathway, making sure that you're picking the correct courses uh, if you have any questions about that. So an example of courses that are available to all students, sorry, this is grade 12 course options, not grade 11 course options. Why is it always as soon as you start doing the presentation, you notice these little things? Uh, so these are all the grade 12 course options for you to select um, beyond the English. So everyone has to do the for you English or for C English uh, to graduate. Everyone has to take that grade 12 English, no matter what level it's at. 
Uh, the rest of the stuff is in there and we have two new additions for coming in September. Uh, one is going to be the mathematics for engineering sciences with which Mr. Heathfield is going to talk about shortly. And the other one is the social justice uh, course that is in social science and humanities. So those are two new additions this year. We've never run these uh, courses and programs before, so we're actually quite excited to see um, what becomes of them and if students, you know, can connect to, to that through uh, this discussion. Uh, up there again, you know, if you want phys ed, if you're in SHSM, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but if you're in SHSM, you're also really going to want to make sure that you are selecting courses that fit that SHSM criteria. So compulsory courses and pathway, as I said, everyone has to do the grade 12 English. Every student by the time they graduate has to do four English, three math, two science, one phys ed, one uh, French or ESL, so on and so forth. And so the only thing you absolutely have to take in grade 12 is English. Um, beyond that, uh, the only thing you also really need to pay attention to is what you are going to do in your post-secondary pathway. And then you want to start researching backwards so that you know what courses you need to pick for that. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with math because we have Mr. Heathfield here with us to answer math questions and to present his the uh, program course for foundations of analysis and linear algebra. Ooh, it's a fancy title. I like yes. it. All right. So without further ado, here is Mr. Heathfield. Uh, hi, everyone. I'll just I'll try to be brief. Uh, if you noticed in the table before, especially with math, uh, traditionally at our school, we would have the two uh, kind of main grade 12 math courses, advanced functions and calculus vectors in succession. So you would do advanced functions in first semester, followed by calculus and vectors in second semester. Um, so what we're going to try next year for students that are um, highly interested in mathematics and wish to go into a, an engineering slash mathematics slash computer science based program is we want to package the two courses together. Um, can we go to the next slide? I don't. OK, yeah. So the idea of this is we want to run the classes in back to back periods and I'll try to use all of my influence having lived through double periods this year to have a lunch break in between. And the idea will be that we do the concepts from both courses uh, intertwined and thereby allow us to go a lot more deep into the topics of the curriculum and also extend into topics that you wouldn't see uh, typically in in the grade 12 year. Um, and the focus will be more about exploration and to gain an intuition for all of these com concepts that you will see in first year if you're doing such a program. Uh, can we go to the next slide? OK, so broadly speaking, uh, calculus and vectors is kind of a weird course in that it's it's partially about an, or most two thirds is about analysis of functions. Uh, so those of you in the university course uh, have the introductory course in functions, so we just continue on that. And then the other part is about vectors and what, that leads into what's called uh, linear algebra. So if if you choose this course, we will uh, effectively look at all of the, the methods of analyzing functions together uh, from both courses. And we'll also look at the vectors part in a lot more deep and generalized way than you would in the standard course. Um, that's the general spirit of things. If you've had me before, you know how just what that kind of means. If you haven't, um, I don't know what to say. Um, can we go to the next slide? <laughs> All right, so the, the timing of this, so remember every day we'll have, if you choose this, you'll have both classes uh, throughout the day. So two of your four periods would be for this giant double credit math course, uh, which might sound intimidating, but it might actually be better. Um, but three to four days a week will be dedicated to sort of the calculus part and one to two days each week will be dedicated to the linear algebra part. Uh, 
the goal though is to not have like double tests. It's not like two courses. It's really just one course. So all of the assessments will be kind of aimed toward both both courses, including your summatives or exam or whatever ends up happening with that course. It will just be one. So you effectively will have my goal is not to like test you to death. It's it's more to like really explore these concepts deeply and build again your intuition for it. So I don't want to double your studying time. I actually want to be more efficient with your studying time and and to get more interesting things happen. Uh, next slide, please. OK, then the next two slides, just a rough layout of the timing of everything. So this one is the timing of the analysis part or the calculus part, for lack of a better phrase. And those would be the units. Um, if we go to the next slide. The, the vectors or the algebra part would be a lot more long, long uh, spanning. And notice we'll have two weeks to really prepare for the final summative because again, there's only one, but I want to consolidate everything uh, so that you're not disadvantaged for going at this depth. And then last slide, I believe, is the next one. Okay, this is critical. Even though we will move beyond the Ontario expectations, just like in any enhanced section or in any course, uh, I will never grade you on on that. So when we do anything re related to marks, it will purely be from the lens of what was expected for the actual courses, calculus and vectors and advanced functions. So uh, I try very hard not to penalize any student for for doing a, a more rich learning experience. And so that that's like my promise there. Um, the, I also am not in this course. We definitely won't be tests only. Uh, tests are typically an aspect of mathematics courses, but it will be also other types of tasks that allow you to show your reasoning in different ways. And again, if you've had me before, you'll know what that means. And lastly, I just want to stress that um, again, I'm, I'm much more or in this, if you choose this, it's a much more, uh, there's a greater emphasis on learning as opposed to, you know, just preparing for tests all the time. I, I want you to actually under, leave here understanding the materials so that when you go into first year, you can be pretty confident about what you're going to encounter. I think that's all. Um, the next slide I think just says if you have questions, students and or parents, just email me. I'll. I'll speak pretty candidly about what this means. Uh, I want you to choose the right type of course for yourself uh, or for your child. And so um, that's all. Thank you. Uh, so we did have one question that I'm hoping you can cover before you, you leave us. Um, would this course be harder than doing the two uh, separate courses? That's uh, kind of depends on the student. So you, you are doing two, the, you'll have a lot of math in that semester. Um, I don't think it'll be harder because we'll be working, you know, effectively a couple of hours a day in class. I actually prefer students working mostly in class and not having super heavy practice outside of class. So even though in class, I'd like you working very like very diligently. I don't like to saturate you with a lot of work outside of class. So in that sense, if that's what you mean by hard, uh, that's that's what it is. And I, I'll reiterate when I do tests, the tests will have types of questions that would be given in the regular courses. So it doesn't matter if you were enhanced the standard course or this course, the anything that would, would be graded, I would ultimately give something comparable to the the other classes as well. It's just in one in one semester as opposed to spread out over the whole year. But you might prefer it being spread out over the whole year. It's kind of up to you. Perfect. Thank you. Is that all? Oh, uh, question. Is this math course only for enhanced students? No, it's, it's open to to any students in the school. Um, just be very interested in math because it's going to be 
pretty deep stuff that we do. So, but I, I definitely welcome any student. Okay, I think that's it. Um, but if anyone else uh, has any math questions, we can certainly cover them at the end. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much to Mr. Heathfield. And to just change directions a little bit, I want to tell you a bit about dual credit courses. So you may have heard about dual credit courses. Um, some of you might even be in one in semester one. And so I'm excited to tell you about these courses. I think they're a great opportunity for all students to try out. Uh, basically what they are are free college courses that count toward your high school diploma and they count as a completed college credit that normally you would have to pay for if you were attending college but because you're still in high school you have the opportunity to try out a number of courses um, you can take up to four of these while you're in high school um, so these used to be in person and a lot of students would take a dual credit course while they're in a co-op program but you don't necessarily have to be taking co-op to take one of these the reason they were popular when you were in a co-op program is because you would actually have to be away from school one day a week and travel uh, in person to the to the campus to the college and participate in your course so you'd be missing one day a week of school or one day uh, i guess a week of co-op which was e easier for some students to do than actually missing all of their courses so we do have more flexibility now because courses have been online uh, with the exception of a few of the more hands-on courses um, students can select a course, they register for it, uh, they basically attend for a semester virtually and the hours might be after school or they might be about an hour or up to three hours, let's say a week uh, where you would not be in your regular class, but you would be connecting to your college course and uh, earning a credit for it. So just to give you a couple of uh, um, examples, there is an up to date list for semester two coming soon and this is also something you can do next year. Some of the popular ones with our students have been animation, forensic psychology, fashion design, business, police foundations, uh, construction, welding. So if you find yourself with a spare period and you'd rather not have a spare and you are looking for something else, but you don't really see anything else in day school that you're interested in, you can always take one of these. Uh, we've had a lot of success and students have been quite interested in them. So um, you will see us post to the student services site uh, quite soon, the new list and please reach out to me directly, or if you are talking to your teacher, just uh, eventually it's gonna to come to me and I can help you with the registration paperwork and getting you signed up for semester two or for next year. Um, if you're interested in your grade 12 year, it would be around uh, probably April or May that we would be registering. Okay, and moving on right now to pathway planning and course selection, a few important steps about pathway planning. Um, and picking your courses. So it is an ongoing process. We do want you to get started nice and early and it still is early uh, for you to start thinking about what you want to do um, even after high school. Um, it is an ongoing process. So if you do end up making a change, we are going to work with you to make sure you have the correct courses. So don't worry if you were on one pathway and then later on you all of a sudden switched it, you know, it does happen and we will make sure that you get into the courses and figure out what you need to do to get to that pathway. Um, remember, when you submit your courses, you are going to only submit them once. Um, if you find that you go ahead and you actually select your courses and then you realize you've made a mistake or something's wrong, you, you won't be able to get back in. You are going to have to contact your guidance counselor. And a couple more things for, uh, for you to consider. We'd like you to think about what is it that you enjoy doing? What is my plan post-secondary? Am I, am I thinking college? Am I thinking university, apprenticeship, workplace? Uh, what do I enjoy? Um, Another thing that we want to remind you of is once you actually go ahead and select your courses, you are going to be prompted to uh, have a parent or guardian approve your courses. So we're not we on our end here at the school, we're not going to be able to approve them um, or process them rather and unless a parent or guardian has also approved them. So please make sure you enter a valid email address for your parents or guardians so that we can get you uh, just confirmed and approved as soon as possible. OK, and next slide is uh, oh about the skilled trades programs and careers. So we do have a lot of students asking us about, you know, where can they find more information on this? And uh, and there is a lot of information out there and there's some students that are exploring and considering skilled trades as a career. And uh, an excellent place to start is by reviewing some of the college programs. You don't necessarily have to go through a college program if you're considering an apprenticeship. Uh, but one of the advantages of doing so is that you might be able to simultaneously get your apprenticeship training while you're also uh, building your skills in a college program. So you can also do some more research in my blueprint about apprenticeship opportunities. 
And sometimes we get questions on um, you know, the difference between college and why attend college over university or, or vice versa. Um, and there are some things about college that people may not know. Um, there are a lot of innovative and groundbreaking programs, a lot of new changes every year. There are a lot of programs to choose from because colleges offer everything from certificate programs, which could be uh, done in as quickly as one year, to diploma programs, maybe two or three years, to degree programs uh, similar to what is offered at universities. So depending on what you need, what type of program and what type of career you're looking for after, uh, that is going to help you decide which type of these programs you may need. Um, at a lot of colleges, there is a variety. There is something for everyone. Uh, you do have opportunities for real world experience before you graduate. Um, and, you know, another big advantage is uh, you get to graduate with less debt because uh, if you compare the prices, sometimes you will see that there um, you, know, you can get a really good education for not as much as it costs for university. So please think about what you want to do after and that's going to help you decide on whether you need college uh, or whether you need university or maybe you need a combination, which I will talk to you about in a minute when we get to the next few slides. Um, if you're applying to university, uh, you again, whether it's college or university, we do encourage you to start planning earlier. Uh, if, if it's university for sure that you know you want, you are going to start researching the OUAC, um, Ontario University Application Centre. And for students that are currently in high school, which is all of you, uh, you would be filling out the 101 application. Um, we do encourage you to please look at what is required for your programs of interest. So look at admission requirements and figure out what it is exactly that you're going to need from leaving high school um, in order to be accepted into university. And we, there are things listed that are required courses, which means you absolutely need to have those. And then sometimes courses may be not required, but recommended. So you won't need them to get an offer for that university, but it could help you to have that course once you do have an offer and once you begin the program. Um, so please do your research and so you know what all your options are. Credit transfer between colleges and universities in Ontario. We often hear uh, the question, what if I change my mind? I accept a program, I go to that school and then I either move or I would like to you know, go from one school to the other for whatever reason. Um, most colleges and universities do have agreements for transferring and giving you some credit for the work that you did and the credits that you earned at one school versus another. So there is a site there with more information on this. And I also want to draw your attention to the link at the very bottom of the page, the Collaborative University and College Programs, which some people haven't heard of, but they're, they're quite excellent. And collaborative programs are agreements between colleges and universities. And these generally include two years of university and two years in college. Um, so if you click on that link, it'll take you to an alphabetical list of all of the universities and their partnerships with colleges and what type of programs they have. So sometimes students are having a hard time to decide between, you know, they like some college programs and they love other university programs. So checking out the options offered through collaborative university and college programs could be a great option for you. All right, uh, so if you are interested in applying to the US, I know many of you are already thinking whether or not you are within Canada or the United States or maybe even internationally, uh, please know that there is at least a six week uh, prior to application deadline for you to request assistance from your guidance counselor, as well as any teachers that you need for Um, too many times students uh, will send us an email a week before saying I'm going to apply to the United States. I need my Common App created, uploaded, updated, a reference letter, the whole uh, gambit of uh, application necessaries. Uh, and it's just it's not enough time. OK, uh, so one thing I always really emphasize to all students who are looking to go to the US is that uh, either through Common App or another application system, please, please, please be aware that the expectation is that you are going to request assistance uh, no less than six weeks prior. For those who are considering early decision, um, if you were applying right now, uh, one, you'd be late because it was back uh, a couple weeks ago in, in November, uh, but two, that would obviously be If we had done this presentation a couple weeks ago, which was originally when we were intending to do it, you would have already been too late. OK, so if you are considering early decision for US schools, you need to inform your guidance counselor first thing in September. Um, 
And then please note, assistance on, on your application and recommendation letters is a courtesy. It is not a requirement. Uh, please be respect, respectful of classroom teachers. These applications, they are time, uh, time consuming both for you and for us. So there are some things that you're really going to want to take into consideration when you are applying to U.S. schools. One, are you uh, capable of financial support for these programs? The United States is very expensive. So before you start applying, please do your research. Make sure that you um, have either the financial uh, assistance that's set up or you have some kind of um, maybe scholarship that you're looking into, but that, that financial stability is going to be there because it is a, a heavy burden to bear um, and no one wants to go through the whole application process and then you get into your dream school and then you realize that you that the financial uh, need is just, it's too heavy. Uh, the other part of it is, are you applying to a program that you know you are confident you're going to be successful in? Okay. As I said, some of these are very time consuming and you will have to do essays, answers, interviews, make sure that the time is worth it, especially if you're being realistic about those programs. Are you ready to live that far away from home is another big uh, concern and that goes for U.S. schools and international schools. Are you ready to be a whole ocean away from your family? Are you ready to be you know, potentially an eight hour flight away from your family? Uh, please really think about it, reflect, and make sure that you're you're good with that decision. And then also, it sounds terrible, but the ego is a very big thing that a lot of students uh, have to contend with when it comes to applying to U.S. schools. And sometimes we apply just to see if we can get in. Uh, and honestly, that is a lot of time on your uh, behalf that you have invested just to see if you could get in but it's also a lot of time for teachers, for guidance counselors and support staff to assist you with that application. So take all of those into consideration before you actually approach your guidance counselor and your teachers for those uh, recommendation letters to make sure that you really have thought long and hard, you've reviewed with your parents. Maybe you wanna talk to your guidance counselor ahead of time to say like, is this really a good choice for me? And we will help you. How guidance counselors help with your applications to outside of Ontario, uh, to the U.S. and overseas is just that. We help with the applications. We do the uh, school profile. We'll upload your um, transcripts. We'll do the letters of recommendation. We'll help with all of that stuff. What we do not organize are SATs. Okay, so if you truly are thinking of going to U.S. schools, a lot of U.S. schools have pulled away from requiring the SAT, but if you decide that you're going to do that as part of your application, please make sure you are booking that early. Uh, many fill up quite quickly and you don't really want to wait too long. You don't want to be doing your SATs in the spring because most decisions are made by then. So in your grade 12 year, I would say going into grade 12, if you were doing them in the summer or September, October, you're good. Um, November and December at the latest uh, is fine because Common App applications are due uh, January 1st. So please make sure that you're paying close attention to all of those deadlines and timelines. Um, the other thing to consider as well is we do not calculate your GPA. So your GPA consists of all grades from grade nine to grade 12. So that is something that you are going to have to do. So we don't do ranking, we don't do GPA, we don't do any of that stuff. Uh, so that is uh, something that you would either calculate on your own, but we also let the Common App and other application services know that we do not calculate those. Uh, so in follow up to a lot of the information that we've given you about the various pathways for post-secondary. So one, there was apprenticeship. We've got a list of resources here uh, for apprenticeship, college, uh, community living, university, workplace, other including the Canadian Coast Guard, Canadian Forces, uh, college and university transfer credits, as well as gap year. It's a great opportunity, especially if people want to uh, get that work experience first and kind of really figure things out or save up money. So please, going into it, you want to consider your strengths, your interests. What is it that you really are passionate about? And you're going to want to look when you are researching your programs to, to find something that is truly along that path, because this could potentially be your career, right? For 
well, a good chunk of time and you want to make sure that it, it feeds your passion and it feeds your interest. Uh, consider your options through uh, recreational and social leadership, volunteer, part-time employment, uh, experiential learning programs. Some of you are already doing SHSM, so that gives you that criteria. Some have part-time employment uh, or some of your volunteer work falls underneath your passions and hobbies, and that's great. And then you want to consider your goals and make sure that you're pursuing those in there. And then, of course, as always, if you need any extra help or you have questions or you just need a sounding board every now and then, your guidance counselor is a fantastic resource for that. All right, uh, SHSM. Uh, so if you are in currently in the SHSM Arts and Culture, make sure when you are going through your course selection that you by the end of grade 12 will have completed your eight specific course bundles that you complete that you will have completed your sector certifications and training that you've participated in everything that you need to participate that you've documented everything that you need to document if you are unsure if the courses that you want to select meet that criteria you need to speak to mr lalonde Okay, so review everything with Mr. Lalonde. He is there to help you. He is your SHSM lead and he can help you with all of that stuff. Same too with uh, health and wellness. So if you are in a health and wellness SHSM, please make sure that you are picking courses for those that nine course bundle that you have to do, that you've done your certifications, that you've done everything. And Ms. Uh, Raybold is the person that you are going to want to connect with if you are not sure. So if you are selecting your courses, um, health and wellness, again, if you've taken your sciences and you wanna take something a little bit different, uh, phys ed is a, a great option for you to make up some of those those nine courses, including kinesiology. So kinesiolo introduction to kinesiology is a grade 12 course. It counts towards your university uh, top six. So if you're looking for another option for health and wellness and you're, you know, you've taken the sciences and you want to try something else, um, then you're good. Some more important things to remember. Summer school, if you already know that you're going to be taking a particular course in the summer, uh, please do not also include that course in your course selections for next year. Um, so we are asking you to uh, not select that and instead select what you would like to take instead. Uh, there's also a spot on your My Blueprint account when you're doing your course selections. You will be able to write us a note if you, for example, if there's something that was a required course or something that we're expecting you to have next year in day school, but you have an alternate plan, please let us know. You can write a comment saying I plan to take this course in summer school. Um, second reminder here, if you're in the enhanced learning program, uh, students in the ELP are expected to take enhanced level courses where available. Um, and so in the core subject areas, they are usually available. Um, special education students, you can only take the GLE learning strategies courses if you have an individual education plan. Um, and finally, Ms. Ora already commented on specialist high skills major, uh, just double checking that you've completed all your requirements for SHSM. Make sure you're reviewing everything and you don't want to be at the end of your grade 12 year and realize that you've missed a certification or missed a course. So please double check that. Um, next slide, please. So timing, we, we do want you to plan early so you can review everything, feel ready, not feel stressed, know all your options, um, make your, your informed decisions. So we, we remind you that course selection and when we build a timetable, it is based on a first come first serve basis. So please start early, have everything ready to go. As Ms. Orr said, you can have it planned out and then when it opens uh, in January, you can then go ahead and submit them. Um, if there is a course conflict or a course cancellation, which sometimes happens, uh, we do ask that you select an alternate course. So there will be a spot there when you're in my blueprint for you to select an extra elective. So in case your first choice elective is not available, we will then look to your um, alternative optional course. Uh, and some final thoughts. So we do expect that um, that you, you know, students and your families will go by these school policies when you're selecting courses. Make sure you have the prerequisites and you're not selecting um, a course that's, um, you know, that you're not eligible to take. Um, if you don't meet expectations for a certain course selection, your, your selections will be returned to you so that you can revise them. Uh, we also want to remind you that uh, I think we mentioned this already, but once you do submit them, you are going to be prompted to have a parent or guardian sign your selections. 
Uh, so please make sure that you do that as well. Otherwise, on our end, we won't be able to process them. Uh, an important point about timetable changes. Uh, we do have this question a lot. We always try our best to accommodate wherever possible, but timetable changes are quite difficult sometimes. Sometimes they're not even possible, especially when the school year begins. So uh, there is going to be an opportunity in March and later on in August for you to request a change. If you've changed your mind or you've um, you know, planned your pathway differently and you need a course change, there's going to be an opportunity, but there, there's not going to be an opportunity later on. So we do ask that you prepare carefully, look for these windows of opportunity if you do need to make a change. Um, yep, yeah, and uh, please keep in mind that sometimes, you know, a change we will try if possible, but, but they are not guaranteed. Um, yep, yeah, and finally, just a reminder to please contact us, uh, your guidance counselors, if you have any questions. OK, so important dates, documents and resources. So as I said, that virtual course fair is going to go live December 1st. Uh, that website is going to be sent out to uh, students along with the course selection guidelines. Uh, everything will be listed in that email that will come out for you um, on December 1st. You're also going to be able to access that uh, website link through the student services site. And you can access that through any of the posters throughout the school. Uh, or even our social media, our main links are always right in there. Uh, you also have the course selection opens January 10th, 2022. The first round will close February 1st, 2022. And then that's when guidance counselor, guidance counselors start reviewing all of those course selections. We'll start sending back anything that's maybe incorrect or incomplete. Uh, we will also uh, then reopen for course selection changes from February 14th to the 18th. And that's really only if you've picked the wrong pathway. So let's say you meant to pick, um, you know, MHF, but you picked data management instead. Or let's say you picked college level English, but you wanted to do university or whatever it is that you are part of that pathway for your applications. Uh, course selection changes will be open for them for the, that week which is different from the course change request. So what's really important and what Ms. Lagudisa just talked about with that timing matters is once you hit submit, your time that you submitted is locked in. If you request for your guidance counselor to reallow your course submissions, your clock starts again when you resubmit. So let's say you had the submission date of January 10th at 8 a.m that's now going to become whenever it is that you handed it in that second time. OK, so any of that um, time frame that you had is erased when you ask for your course selection to be resubmitted. So just so that you're very aware uh, that that's what you're asking us to do. The course selection changes is different because you're going to fill out a Google form and your guidance counselor is going to go in there and actually manually make the changes so that your submission time stays what it is. OK, uh, March, the week before March break, uh, everything rolls over from my blueprint to SIS. And this is really important because it means that when you go in and you say, I tried to change a course in my blueprint, but it didn't let me. That's because my blueprint no longer has anything to do with course selection after March break in everything. It has everything in SIS now. So if we need to make a change, we now need to make that change in the student information system rather than in my blueprint. OK, so that's that first round of course change requests. So let's say now you've been in your semester two classes for a little over a month and we are going back to a regular semester system. So it means you've done your four courses uh, each day and you've realized that, you know what, maybe, uh, I don't know, the course, your tech course just isn't what you thought it was. Or maybe you've actually fallen in love with it and you are really sad that you didn't pick it for next year and you want to add that. You can request your course change from March 21st to March 25th and we will make that change in SIS. From then on, there are no more changes. The only contact that you will have with your guidance counselor from March 25th to the end of the school year is if there's a course conflict or a course cancellation. That is it. We are not making any other course changes beyond March 25th until August 29th. So much like this year, course change request timeframe falls from August 29th to September 9th. 
so that by the time you start semester one next year, your timetable is your timetable and we are not making any further changes. So it is super important that you are going through, you are doing your research, you are making sure you're picking the correct courses along the correct pathway that filter into the programs that you really wanna do, whether it be apprenticeship, college, university, workplace, whatever, and you're really doing that research. If you have questions, we have the course selection information sheet. We have the common course calendar, which is it lists all of our offered courses on there. You have the student services site you have. And then, of course, to make sure you're ready for graduation, the community service volunteering and how to submit your hours. There are over 70 current grade 12s who have not yet handed in their community service hours. OK, so you don't want to be one of them because then your guidance counselor starts emailing you uh, now and start saying like, hey, do you want to graduate? You need to do your hours. So you can start handing those hours in now. You do not need to wait until you get to the 40. Uh, please hand them in as you've got them and you can do that all of that electronically. And now we are at the portion of the presentation where we are happy to take questions. We have been answering some questions in the chat as we've been going on. Um, one question that I've seen now a few times is about whether or not grade 11 marks matter. So if you are applying to the states, which is the easy answer, so I'll start there. The answer is yes, your grade 9 through grade 12 marks matter because they all uh, go into your GPA, which means that every single grade that you have taken since grade 9 factors into your GPA score. So yes, of course it matters. In terms of Ontario, your actual application and what universities take into consideration is your top six for you 4M courses. But let's say you are well, one of which has to include English. Okay, no matter what, English is included. But let's say you are going into a computer engineering program and they have said that you must take computer engineering uh, the whole way through, right? So they want to see grade 11, grade 12 computer engineering. If you don't have grade 12 computer engineering until second semester, they can go and look at your grade 11 final mark just to see what they can expect from you. Same thing if you're going into something that's medical or science related and so you have to have grade 12 chemistry and biology, let's say you're not going to have biology done until the end of semester two, then yeah, they can go and look at your grade 11 biology mark. Does that factor in at the end of the day? Well, remember they're looking at your average from your top six for you 4M courses. So it's a soft answer of yes, of course they matter, but they don't factor into the average that the universities use when determining if you've met that, thresh that threshold. OK, so you're going to really want to make sure you've done your research, you know what it is that you're doing, you're doing the best that you can this year and next year, uh, and then your guidance counselors are there to support you for that. Now, does it mean that you can request these required courses to happen in semester one? No, uh, that's not how the timetable works. Unfortunately, I can't give you know six courses in semester one. Uh, the timetable is built to allow for all those courses to work in harmony. So yes, there are going to be some times that you have your biology in semester two. Uh, for those of you who are thinking about doing the math course, uh, this actually is part of the reason why Mr. Heathfield wanted to do this math dual credit kind of co program um, is so that if you are going into a program that does require advanced functions and calculus and vectors, as you may know, um, advanced functions only ever run semester one and calculus and vectors only ever run semester two. So if you know you're going into something that requires both of those uh, courses as part of your application, you're really going to want to look at that program because now it means that your MHF and your MCV are going to be done in semester one. And so this your preferred program of choice is less likely to look at your grade 11 mark because your grade 12 marks are going to be done by the end of semester one. So it's a long answer for a pretty straightforward question, but if you ever have any questions or concerns, please reach out to your um, guidance counselor and we can go over things specifically. Um, so yeah, if you add any of your questions, you've got Ms. Downey, uh, Ms. Lagudis, Mr. Heathfield and I to, to answer any of your questions. 
Uh, so please type them in the chat. And uh, if anyone else has seen questions that they want to cover, please let me know. And or yeah. I see a couple of questions I just want to cover here to clarify. Um, we have a, a few students asking about uh, what does the U and M mean in the codes? Um, ah. So when we're saying, uh, if when we're saying a university might be asking for U or M courses, the U means university level. So let's say grade 12 university level English would be ENG for U O or for U E if you're in the enhanced program. Um, and an M is we call it mixed, which is college and university. So for example, uh, there's a grade 11, I can't think of one off the top of my head, uh, something that ends in, uh, let's say, you know, 4MO or 3MO. Uh, generally, most universities will accept U and M level courses. Uh, sometimes a highly competitive program may say only up to two courses can be M. Uh, but generally when it's an M, you know, some of our courses at the grade 12, grade 12 level at our school are U and some are M. So just double check your program. Uh, your program will like, if it's a university program, they will likely say you need six grade 12 U or M credits. Um, so in an M credit would count for university then um, and for college. Um, and just one more thing, I, I, unless anybody else needs to add on to the U or M discussion. I just saw another question that I wanted to just quickly mention. We had a few questions about uh, summer school. And we know summer school information is going to be available closer to the summer in the springtime. Um, and also just a quick reminder, you might have seen this on the student services site, but there are some other alternative options such as night school. So if you're in your grade 12 year right now and you, let's say we're hoping to take something in semester two and maybe it wasn't available, maybe you're still on a wait list for it or you just changed your mind and now would like to take it, you can consider night school as well for semester two. And night school registration will open on November 30th. Um, so if you, you know, you'll see the list posted on the student services site, take a look. If you do need night school, night school does run Monday and Wednesday nights. It's going to be in semester two, Monday and Wednesday from 6 to 930 uh, and it is going to be virtual. So take a look at that if you need to. Perfect. Um, I saw a question about early applications, early selections. So I want to say it now because <laughs> you'll hear it plenty. In terms of Ontario, there are no early applications for university. There's one exception. It's at Queen's, but everything else is just you apply early. You might have an offer early. In the states, that is different. There are early uh, application deadlines that are in November. Those are deadlines. You have to meet them in order to be considered for those. So the US does have those early application deadlines. Ontario does not. So in October of next year, you will receive your PIN from um, OUAC. I don't know if that's gonna come in hard copy or electronic. We tried doing an electronic this year. It seemed to have worked fairly well. So I'm hoping that'll be what happens because it is much faster, quicker. Um, and so what you're going to be able to do as soon as you have your pin, you can go in and apply. And yes, there are certain programs that will be like, OK, you know what? You've got the courses on your timetable that you need to have. Uh, things are already looking pretty good. Your grade 11 marks look solid, so we can predict that you're probably going to achieve the same kind of marks. Here's a conditional acceptance because you've already hit that threshold um, keyword there conditionally. That does not mean that you applied for early applications. It just means that you applied early. OK, there are a couple exceptions to the rule, but they are few and far between. So please, when you are looking at your timetable or you're looking at your courses or you're talking to your teachers and your guidance counselors and you're all, I need to apply early. I have to hit my early application deadline. For Ontario, it's not a thing, OK? Um, so please make sure that you are paying really close attention to the deadlines that do exist, uh, because especially for university, they are solid, hard deadlines where college is far more fluid. They've got rolling enrollment uh, and you can apply at any time. So I really do want to make sure that, you know, people who are saying I'm applying early too. Yeah, you are. You're just applying early because you've got your ducks in a row. You know what your programs are. You're ready to do it and just get it out of the way, because at the same time, if you apply early, especially for universities, they are going to start sending you what's called a supplemental application. Every university calls it something different, 
but that gives you more time because no matter what, those supplements applications have a deadline. And if you apply in November or if you apply in January, that supplements application is still due when it's due. So it could be that they're due the 1st of February. So if you wait to apply till the first week of January, you only have three weeks to do that supplements application. But if you apply in December, you have nearly two weeks or sorry, two months to fill out those supplements applications. So I always recommend that you apply early but that it does not, don't call it the early application deadlines. It just means that you are applying early. So that's my, my little spiel about that. <laughs> uh, when can we start selecting our course selections and also where can I pick an appointment with my guidance counselor? So you can start actually adding your courses to my blueprint right now. Uh, you can go into my blueprint, go into your high school planner and start uh, hitting buttons and adding courses to your timetable. You can absolutely start doing that now. You cannot hit submit until January 10th. If you go onto the student services site, the very home page says make an appointment with my guidance counselor and it's got our lovely faces on it and you can make the appointment through that Google form. Uh, Duke of Ed. Yes, absolutely. So we had a question about Duke of Ed. Um, as you're going into grade 11, uh, there is an age threshold uh, for students who are looking to do a Duke of Ed award. There is uh, bronze, silver, and gold. So being as your age criteria, you'd be looking to do either silver or gold. And this award is actually kind of cool because it's multi-leveled. Uh, so you achieve a certificate and award when you finish each of those levels. And so you do something that's like a skill. So let's say you wanted to learn how to play uh, tennis, okay? So you say in the next three months, I wanna learn how to do a, a serve for tennis. And so you've come up with your goal, you set about doing that goal, you've now achieved that, that piece of that award. And then you're gonna do service, which is much of the community service that you already do. You would just track that in there. Uh, so they have various different things um, for you to look at. I'm gonna actually put the uh, link right here in case you are interested in doing a little bit more research about the Duke of Ed. It's great, and if you're looking to start and register, you can go right in, uh, sign up. Uh, there is a small fee to register, and then it will notify me that you have created your account. I'll go in and, and make an appointment with you so that we can get you started. Ms. Orrid, we just had a question here about uh, a grade 11 student. Uh, probably it's happening to more than a couple of students that received an OUAC pin mm -hmm. um, and students wondering, you know, what that means, what's happening. So, yeah, sometimes a grade 11 student will receive one. You don't actually need it. You're, you, it's not going to be useful to you until you're in your grade 12 year. So um, you can disregard that if you have gone ahead and, and actually started to create your account. Uh, I believe you are going to have to next year when you actually need it because you already used that one email, you're going to have to set up a new email. So you won't be able to use that same email address to re, to re um, you know, to, to actually begin your proper OUAC account. Uh, basically, don't worry about it. It's not there isn't anything for you to do with it this year because you're not applying in your grade 12 year. You're in your grade 11 year. You're applying in your grade 12 year. So. Uh, don't worry if you began a registration and you weren't quite sure what's happening. Just uh, you can leave it and then next year you will just have to make the correct account with a different email uh, address. Okay, um, trying to see. So can the new math course be accepted at uh, university? So the course code is actually going to still be the same. So if you were taking the new math course independently, so you were just gonna do the advanced functions in semester one and the calculus and vectors in semester two, then what you would um, have is the MHF 4UO, 4UE on your uh, transcript and then same thing you'd have the MCV for you uh, for second semester. You are still going to see that on your transcript and universities are still going to see that on the transcript. So yes, universities are absolutely going to accept the courses within these programs. 
Uh, please don't worry about that. The code doesn't change. It is in my blueprint right now. Uh, so if you are looking for it, it's MCV4U9 or MHF4U9. So you can actually add it right now. Make sure you're adding both. Uh, so that when it rolls over into that student information system, we know that we're timetabling those two courses together for you. Um, and then again, that nine gets dropped. The sixth character of courses gets dropped on that transcript. So all the student, all the, the schools are going to see is that you did do the advanced functions and the calcum vectors. So no problem there. Okay, here's a good question. I don't know if uh, uh, either Ms. Downey or uh, Ms. Lewis want to take it. So how do uh, how does the Woodlands help uh, with the process of applications if I decide to take a gap year? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and sometimes students do need to take a gap year for different reasons, or if you just want to know your options, we can definitely help you with that. Um, if you are graduating, so you graduate, but you're not planning to go right away, um, we can definitely have a conversation with you before you leave so you do know some of your options. And we do often have some of our former students contacting us. Uh, we will definitely still be here to support you with any questions. If you're no longer registered in high school, then it would be a different application that you complete through the OUAC if it's a university. Um, and yeah, we, we, yeah, I guess we just encourage you to, to keep in touch and we will try to set you up with some information beforehand if you know for sure. Uh, but if you do need to reach us closer to the time of your actual um, application, we welcome you to still keep in touch and we will help you. All right. OK, uh, are there any other questions at this time? There's only one thing, uh, Ms. Orr, if I could bring it up. You mentioned a lot about the emphasizing the community service and students um, getting those hours in now. One other thing I would like to add, and students have already asked me this question this year, they, the great, current grade 12 students um, who've now applied to uh, university and college, uh, some of them are discovering when they're sending their application in, it's saying that their community service is not turned in. And they're saying, but I did turn it in in uh, September, October. You should know that the second you submit it to your guidance counselor, um, the University Application Center does not receive it right away. There is there can be a period of a couple months before um, their site is refreshed and it's uploaded. So if you want to ensure that when you apply to university next year, that the university see that you've com completed your community service in the fall, you really should submit it in this school year, in your grade 11 year. Perfect, thank you. Um, so uh, Ms. Lagudis, there's a question about scholarships. Oh, okay, great. Uh, yep, I'm uh, the guidance counselor that helps with the scholarship information. Um, an excellent place to start. Well, first of all, if you're in grade 11, um, it's, it is good to start planning early, although most of the scholarships are for grade 12 graduating students. So when you're in grade 12, you are going to be invited to a Google Classroom that will be for graduating students. And there we will have a, a section dedicated to scholarships. So for some introductory uh, planning and research, we suggest going on to a couple of sites that will let you know all the opportunities coming up during the year. So Scholarships Canada or Iconic, uh, and that's spelled with a Y, which I can add into the into the comments here for your reference. Um, some people say, you know, do do you get an automatic scholarship with certain grades? And a lot of colleges and universities will also give you a, an entrance scholarship. So when your marks are over a certain percentage, uh, the higher your marks, the more the university or college might offer you in terms of some uh, some funds to help you pay for the year. Um, sometimes during the year, there might be some major scholarships where the school can nominate one student to go forward for the next round of so scholarship selection. So we will post those opportunities as they come up and let you know how you can go about requesting to be nominated by the school. You would submit your application and then the scholarship committee would meet and, and you know select one student if it is one of those major uh, major awards. There are a lot of opportunities that get posted and a majority of them are coming in the new year of your grade 12 year. So basically when it's your grade 12 year, 
Um, there will be a few available in the fall, and we encourage you to sign up for some of these websites. Go and visit them. Check the, the Google Classroom for graduating students regularly and see what's available and really take advantage of them because a lot of times you might think you might not qualify for a scholarship and sometimes um, sometimes nobody might apply and all that money just kind of sits there. So there are there is a lot of money available to help you support you with that. So uh, even on Peel on the Peel Board website, if you look up Peel Board scholarships, you'll see a big list there. A lot of these are for next year, so you'll see probably information from the last year. So it might be last year's uh, due dates, but still you can have an idea of what's to come. So great idea to start thinking about that early. And sometimes opportunities do come up for grade 11 or younger students as well. So if we have something like that, we will we'll definitely share it with you and post about it in the student services site. Perfect, thank you. Um, a question about the 40 hours and beyond the 40 hours. So uh, I'm just going to tack on to some of the scholarship information that Ms. Lagudis just uh, mentioned. So if you're considering doing more than your 40 hours, yes, there are some school awards that are about community service and commitment to your community. Uh, just like there are some scholarships out there that you can find that are based solely on criteria of community service. But keep in mind that it's not necessarily about the quantity of hours that you've done, but more about the quality and connection and the enrichment of it. Like, how did you leave your mark on that community? How did you support that community? How did you help with that? So yes, the hours do count as part of those scholarships, but it's also about what you you did and the impact that you left within that community service. So, you know, I, I used the example earlier this evening, um, uh, today when I was talking to someone that, uh, so let's say you went and did 400 hours at the library. That's great, that's fantastic. But if you went and did 50 hours at the hospital, right? Like depending on some of those scholarships, they're going to depend on the quality of service rather than the quantity of the hours that you've done. Um, OK, I think I asked leave that too. Someone yeah. had asked if it affect um, if they see the university admissions, um, see if you've done beyond 40 hours. So the university itself, they're just going to see an X that you completed your hours. But it's it's what Miss Orr is saying in terms of um, scholarships or if you're applying to a university such as say Waterloo that asks for an additional information, um, that's where you'd put in all those extra hours. It's not for just the um, the university application in itself. Um, some uh, questions. Where do I submit my volunteer hours? On the student services site. <laughs> Uh, so if you go there, there's a whole page that not only has uh, community service criteria and guidelines, you can submit your stuff there. We've also listed a bunch of opportunities as they become available. So if you're stumped as to how to volunteer or where to volunteer, we post the opportunities on that student services site. There's also a Google form. It says submit your hours. Uh, please click on that and then you just have to upload. No, you do not need to come and then hand in a hard copy. We will print them from there. Um, I think uh, we get a better chance to. Da, 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 da. Oh, I, I think we just discussed it. So no, uh, your university is going to see that they've been completed. Uh, but those supplemental applications, uh, so here's the thing. OUAC looks at you as a number, right? Your grades are uploaded there, your courses are uploaded there, the base criteria of did you pass your OSSLT, did you do your 40 hours, all that checkmark stuff is in the OUAC application. All of those supplemental applications, secondary applications, follow-up applications that they send to you is where you really shine and let them know who you are as a person. And so some of those are essays, some of those are questions, and some of those are the experiences that you can talk to uh, and speak to that would make you a great candidate for their program. Something that you can pull from would be your volunteer experience. So if you do 40 hours or 400 hours, again, the, qu the quantity doesn't matter so much so as the quality of the work. So if you've vol been volunteering or doing community service in something that really speaks to the program that you're applying to, then that's something else that you can talk about in those supplemental applications. So, I mean, short answer is your 40 hours is a, t is a check mark in OUAC to say that you're done. If you are doing more than that, 
uh, then you'll you'll see that in there. Okay, well, I think we are all done for this evening. I don't see any other additional uh, questions. Um, so I, anybody else see anything that we want to cover? I don't think so. I think just a quick reminder for everybody to just keep checking your graduation requirements. Um, you know, sometimes it's been a while since you might have looked at them just to make sure you're on track, just to make sure everything's been entered, uh, nothing that you might have forgotten. Uh, maybe there was a, a course that you were scheduled to take in grade 10 and you didn't take it. You know, sometimes this happens with careers and civics where people said, OK, I'll just put that one off or I'll take it in summer. And then maybe your summer plans changed and you never got that course. And now now you're you know almost in grade 12 and you realize, wait a minute, I'm still missing one of my requirements. So. I think uh, that's a good reminder to just double check. And if you have any questions, please just check in with uh, one of us and we can help you. Excellent. The only other thing I'd like to mention is on Tuesdays and Thursdays, as you may know, um, I, uh, a guidance counselor is out in front of the cafeteria to answer your questions. So if after this presentation, maybe you're watching it again and you have other questions, uh, you can feel free to approach me on a, a Tuesday or a Thursday at 11 a.m. Thank you.